Any, anything at this stage? Okay, we shall, we shall start up. Worries about technology aren't new. We're worrying about the internet today and ethical issues. Many people are worried about the internet precisely because of the opportunity it gives for spewing out things from the id and the lowest levels of the personality, as it were, at high speed and uh, without any consideration of what you say. Our inquiry here is whether the internet behaviours have aspects that may be considered ethical. Any sense? This is setting the scene for the day. There's no real concept of internet ethics. When I say that, it's not quite fair. There's two people in the room who have written substantially on this, but it's been a minority scholarly pursuit becoming a much more, much wider interest and serious concern. Three views on what constitutes ethics. Um, the two best-known ones traditionally are utilitarianism or consideration of consequences, which in this country we associate with James Stuart Mill, which roughly says that the best act is that which leads to the greatest good of the greatest number. There are many arguments against it because it justifies sort of you know bumping people off if. Um, if the outcome's right, and that's basically how wars are prosecuted after all. It's something that the NHS takes very seriously in the kind of calculations they do on whether or not to give you a replacement organ. They think, are we spending the money right on you, giving you a new leg, rather than giving 50 people something less radical? The second best known idea we usually associate with Kant is the notion that there, there, are, there are, in some sense, universal moral rules, and you can find out what they are. Um, Kant's formulation is the categorical imperative, so-called, can the principle behind my action be universalized? You cannot honestly say, I will that everybody should act this way. You cannot consistently will that everybody should lie, for example. And therefore, he deduces from this that truth telling is good. I mean, I'm not putting this with any uh, philosophical uh, precision, but you know the idea. Murder is a clearer case. You don't do murder because you can will that no one should murder because it might apply to you. It's really a, a sort of general philosophical version of um, you know, some New Testament precept on doing unto others as they should do unto you. And of course, as George Bernard Shaw once famously said, don't do unto others as they should do unto you, because their tastes may be different. Um, there are many objections, frivolous and serious, to this. The third, I think, is in some ways the most interesting, the revival of what in recent years has been called virtue ethics. Many people associate it with Philippa Foote. Some people trace it to Aristotle. David Hume, the greatest philosopher in these islands, um, certainly held a version of virtue ethics, that, that in some sense the right is connected with character and, and, and specific virtues and their practices are formed by character and training. You can also relate this to ethical codes like Confucianism. But there are many versions of this. It's a slightly a rag bag, but it's, it's been a more productive rag bag than the two old chestnuts at the top in recent years. Does the internet and its design have anything to do with ethics? This will come up. Uh, Tim Berners-Lee, of course, a genius was a physicist, and uh, a physicist who specialised in databases, and that's where the World Wide Web comes from. He saw it originally as a universal tool, but essentially for scientists initially, first physicists, then scientists. But behind it, as you know, there has been, if you can call it an ethics, certainly an intellectual politics behind the web, from the sort of hacker, individualist, anarchic. Um, something to do with the sort of state of mind of computer researchers in the 60s, many of whom are still alive and in the W3 consortium. Um, they're the people who want to defend the death net neutrality, um, putting anything like on the web no matter what the consequences. In some sense, the people who design these technologies are in fact expressing norms in their design. And one of the things some people today want to discuss is whether the internet has design principles inside it that, as it were, express ethical content. I love this quote from Zadie Smith on, um, it's, she didn't use the phrase norm entrepreneurs, it's a phrase that some colleagues here have used. She, as a novelist, stood back and looked at how Zuckerberg and people appeared to act, at least in the movie, and what we know their personal histories. In some sense, we're all having Zuckerberg's personality pushed at us. It's what a sort of techno-geek age 20 would want. Lots of connection, lots of girls. Um, and that has become a sort of worldwide platform which is uh, constraining us and what we can do, given that many people in this room probably are compulsive Facebook users. I mean, it's, that is quite an interesting fact. And does that have any ethical consequences? Possibly not, but it's worth thinking about. One of our starting points is, and uh, you may not all agree with this, and it's a difficult thing to say here in the, if I'm deliberately picking it because we're here in the Royal Academy of Engineering, is about the relation of what we're talking about to codes of practice. Some people on listening to this topic say, oh, there's just codes of practice. Oh, isn't that covered? Don't they have these? Don't the Royal Academy of Engineering have codes of practice? You bet they do. You're going to see them in a minute. Um, the assumption behind that I think most of the presenters share is that codes of practice, whatever their virtues, don't quite capture what we're talking about, but they aren't irrelevant to it either. The Highway Code is one of the original codes of practice in this country, um, but it's not a censored document full of ethical content, although you could question that. There's not a complete divorce between codes of practice and ethics. Um, an observation, I don't know which of the people in the room I owe this to, it's not mine, is that laws can create moral feelings as well as 
laws being a result of moral feelings. I mean, a clear example is drunk driving in this country. Since there have been stringent laws against it, often influenced by European practice, a lot of most people now think it's immoral, as well as illegal. These are the Engineering Council's guidelines uh, for codes of conduct. They say what you think they're going to say, and they're very sensible. They're absolutely excellent. They're not very different from the British Computer Society's list of guidelines. But the question you'll, I'd want you to think about during the day, and the team wants you to think about, is, I mean, how far do guidelines like this really constrain behaviour? Or are they the sort of codes of practice and ethical assessments that everybody ticks before they do research, but actually nobody believes in a bit? I'm not saying that's my view, but I, I do think that the people who make up these guidelines overrate their, their power, their force. Codes of practice, of course, can be ethical. You mustn't take me as saying there's no connection between ethics and codes of practice. I mean, Hippocrates, the father of medicine, first do no harm. That's a code of practice, all right. All doctors have to still, I think, have to swear the Hippocratic Oath. This is what Hippocrates said. It's definitely a moral injunction. Uh, journalists traditionally refuse to name sources. Um, lots of this stuff is about not being sued. Ethics shouldn't be about not being sued, and so often it is. Uh, any questions at this stage on how we carry on? There'll be lunch, there'll be coffee breaks. Okay.